Welcome to the Frederick S. Party Center Spring Conference for 2005 on the subject of looking ahead, forecasting, and planning for the longer range future. Um, now I'm going to turn you over to our presider. Well, I've been asked to uh, preside over the first uh, the first panel in this uh, in this conference, and uh, I assume that David asked me to uh, to perform this role because uh, I uh, know nothing about it. That's my main qualification here. Um, so I'll be uh, entirely uh, Im impartial. Uh, this subject is long-term policy analysis, and our panelists are Jim Dewar of the Rand Center and Adil Najm of. Uh, the Fletcher School at Tufts University. Um, I think these gentlemen are known to you, so I won't uh, bother to uh, with, with a long introduction, uh, but I will simply hand over the microphone to Jim Dewar and ask him to speak for, I think, about a half hour, 35 minutes, if you wish, and then uh, give Adel a chance to respond, and then we can all join in. Uh, the panel should conclude in an hour. Right, can we give ourselves a full hour? Would you like? Um, so I'll try to keep an eye on the, uh, on the clock. As, as we go through. Um, so please welcome Jim Dewar from the RAND Center. Well, I was hoping for a glowing introduction, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to be here. I've, as you can see, I've kept the subtitle of this talk neutral so as not to show my hand on where I fall on this thing. This long-term policy analysis is something that the RAND Party Center wants to take a look at. We're, if we differ from the BU Center, it's primarily in our more policy-oriented focus. And the question became, is there such a thing as long-term policy analysis? If so, how does it differ from short-term policy analysis? And what are its techniques and methods? So first off, by long-term, what we really mean is characterized by deep uncertainty. And in a more technical sense, we mean characterized by structural uncertainty. If your uncertainty is parametric, you know basically how the system works, but you don't know what numbers to plug in, that's parametric uncertainty. If you don't even know how the system works necessarily, then we think of that as structural or deep uncertainty. So long term, in the sense of long term planning, has gotten a bad name because long term doesn't quite quite cut it, but we called it long term, so we're kind of stuck with that name. But what we really mean is this kind of deep uncertainty. So I'm going to actually talk about two of these three things, since I'm going to talk only for about 20 minutes. And the third one, this new long-term policy analysis method I will refer to right at the end. The first thing we did when we thought about long-term policy analysis was what academicians tend to do. We set up a seminar in the Pardee Rand Graduate School to ask the question of whether or not long-term policy analysis made sense. We know that humans can make successful long-term policy decisions. There's the Intercontinental Railway. There's George Kennan even though he didn't like the way containment played out and thought it would happen a lot faster than it did, at least he had a pretty deep understanding of what the Soviet Union was about and what its fragility was. And even when we talk about our own families, you make long-term decisions when you think about education. So we know people do make long-term policy decisions and make them successfully. We also know that they make them unsuccessfully. Everybody's got their favorite example of a long-term policy that went bad. This is my particular favorite. This is energy use per gross national product that was remarkably linear for 83 years, including right around the time of the, of the stock market crash. So this did a remarkable job. We knew when the oil crisis hit in 1973 that it would probably change, that it would probably change in an upward direction. I don't know how well you can see these dotted yellow lines. But we missed the actual by quite a bit. So it is hard for people to envision, as Professor Gelman said last night, it is hard to envision things dramatically different than we 
than we are used to. And part of the trick of long-term policy analysis is making sure that you include some of these off-nominal cases. As a mathematician, I'd like to be able to prove that long-term policy analysis makes a difference, that you can improve policy making by doing long-term policy analysis. But other than counterfactuals or Monday morning quarterbacking, it's hard to prove that the lack of long-term policy analysis has caused problems. The one that I would point to is John Maynard Keynes. There he is. The Economic Consequences of the Peace back in 1919. He wrote a little monograph that asserted that the approach they were taking at the Treaty of Versailles was too punitive against Germany. And I recently reread that. And he doesn't actually say that it would lead to another war, but he obliquely mentions that bad things could happen if they persisted in this very serious punitive action. And we didn't make that same mistake after the Second World War. So if there's any proof that a lack of long-term policy analysis can be a bad thing. This is at least one leg of that proof. There is evidence that people have done good long-term policy analysis. The Panama Canal, the U.S. moved in with a better plan than the French had and actually got it built. The second India study was a study commissioned by the Ford Foundation in the mid-1960s. And what's interesting about it is not the study itself, but the second India revisited study that they did in, 19, in the late 1990s. They went back in and revisited that study, closed the loop on it, and found what they got kind of right and kind of wrong. What they got wrong was they missed the Green Revolution and some some of the liberation of women's rights. But it was, in all, an interesting study in the 60s because in the mid-60s, the point of the Second India was that they thought that between 1965 and 2000, the population in India would double or create a Second India. And the question was, how were you going to handle that doubling? And sure enough, by 2000, they had about twice as many people as they had. And they got some interesting, interesting recommendations out of it. Um, I would also point to the U.S. Social Security system. I know that's kind of an odd thing to point to at this, at this juncture. But the reason I point to this one is because, not because of the system itself necessarily, but because of the fact that FDR did such a good job of making sure that the system would not disappear when he did. That is, this had been tried before, these social safety nets had been tried before. And Franklin Roosevelt clearly saw how to make sure that he could put a system in by calling it insurance and a couple of things like that to make sure that it would not disappear after he did. So he did some long-term thinking on how to make sure that this system, which he wanted so desperately, would outlive him. And probably, for me, one of the most interesting ones, if I can find it here, is the Federal Communications Commission's success on connecting computers to telephone lines. In the mid-60s, you could connect your ear to telephone lines, and that was it. And for a federal bureaucracy to get from there to connecting computers to telephone lines is quite a saga. They, in the process, they developed three different, they did a very adaptive approach to this decision making. They had three major findings that set the policies, computer one, computer two, and what they called the open network, or computer three. And very slowly over time, and making sure they stayed abreast of the technology, they created a system that allowed computers to be connected to telephone lines in the U.S. and enabled the Internet. So when we think of federal bureaucracies as being hopelessly stodgy and, and immobile, the Federal Communications Commission did a very good job of adaptive planning over a long time to create something that we all think is a good idea. So there is evidence that good long-term policy analysis has been done. Now let me talk a little bit about what we know about a structure for long-term policy analysis. 
We think in terms of two different kinds of long-term policy analysis issues. Uh, those that center around clearly significant long-term consequences of actions that we're taking or thinking about taking today. So nuclear waste, when we think long-term, that's more like thousands of years, 10,000 years. Major infrastructure, research and development, clearly just about anything related to children. And the other type is where long-term objectives require some near-term action. A hot one right now is climate change, but outer space is clearly one where if we want to do something in outer space, we've got to be thinking about it now because it's going to be a long time before we get something built to get out there and so forth. So these two different kinds of long-term issues. If we think about long-term policy analysis in the context of short-term policy analysis, here are the five canonical steps to short-term policy analysis for developing some kind of optimal or sound policy. You set the context, you generate alternative policies, you project the consequences of those alternatives, you value those projections, and you pick the best one. Well, as you get farther out in time, it's still not hard to set the context or generate alternatives, but it gets harder to project the consequences. Not only that, it gets harder to value those projections. Anybody with kids knows that much though you try, your kids don't have the same values you do exactly. So even making valuations in the longer range future can be tenuous, which puts the whole enterprise of trying to develop a single optimal policy in the longer range much more questionable. But as we thought about this stuff, the thing that was most interesting to us is that there's another step in long-term policy analysis that you don't often find in short-term policy analysis, and that is that you have to get someone's attention. In short-term policy analysis, they come to you with the problem, typically, and in long-term policy analysis, it's usually the other way around. And this step zero turns out to be obviously important and obviously very difficult. That said, there are other reasons for doing policy analysis other than just coming to a sound policy. And you can see a lot of the reason, other reasons that people talk about doing policy analysis. Herman Kahn's book, The Year 2000, has a nice chapter at the back where he tries to lay out a whole bunch of these reasons for doing policy analysis that don't necessarily have to do with coming to a specific policy conclusion. And these are, there's a, a few of them there. They, they carry over quite well to long-term policy analysis, and you can think of probably a couple others to include on the list that don't include the ones that you would do for short-term policy analysis, particularly looking for slow disasters. And Herman Kahn wanted long-term policy analysis to be a lobby for the future as well. Okay, so. What techniques are there for projecting the consequences into the longer term? Well, a lot of them that we use even in short-term policy analysis are useful in long-term policy analysis. There are some trends that do extrapolate reasonably well in the longer term. And even if they don't, their extrapolations may tell you that they are going to get into trouble and things that can't last forever don't. So trend extrapolations can be useful even in the longer term for telling you what, what can't happen. And there are all sorts of things like envelope curves and cross-impact analysis that go on top of trend extrapolations. Historical analogies, Neustadt and May is probably the best book in terms of thinking about political uses of historical analogies. Um, I like printing in the internet because I wrote a fun paper on a comparison between the printing press as the first one-to-many communications medium and the internet as the first what I thought of, it, of as an any-to-many communications medium. There are some interesting parallels there. But historical analogies are 
what we use a lot as humans, and they're obviously useful for the longer range as well. Scenario planning started at RAND with Herman Kahn and, and Milt Weiner and people like that, and was picked up by, by Royal Dutch Shell. There's Peter Schwartz. And they've taken it over the global business network. And the Montfleur scenarios were scenarios they created to help, help South Africa overcome apartheid. Scenario planning is obviously useful even in the longer term. Simulation and modeling, the Club of Rome kind of gave long-term modeling analysis a bad name. They're still, they just published another book saying how they in fact got it right. But we're starting to see some more of the simulation and modeling come back, particularly in terms of climate modeling, where we're trying to get some long-term climate modeling models that will tell us something about the longer range future. Good and bad science fiction. There's H.G. Wells, there's Arthur C. Clarke, the more scientific or hard, hard science fiction is perhaps more useful sometimes than the softer stuff. But science fiction has all, also been effective in helping people think about the consequences of the long term. And exploratory modeling, this is something I'm going to mention right at the end because this is something that's coming around thanks to the increasing power of, the, of computational resources. You can now start to do simulation and modeling over hundreds or thousands of scenarios. And this is our book from the Rand Pardee Center. If you want to know more about it, it's actually in the April 2005 issue of Scientific American. So this is a timely conference. Or it's a timely publication, I don't know which. Grand theories about how the world works. Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel covered 13,000 years of history. If you ask him what about the next 13,000, he says, "Let me. I'll tell you in 50 years, because he thinks, as E.O. Wilson does, that we're headed into a bottleneck, and we may or may not, as humans, come out of that bottleneck. But a more interesting one, perhaps, is Daniel Bell's Post-Industrial Society, written in 1972 about how he saw society changing. And uh, one, of the, one of the topics that we thought seriously about during our seminar is whether all of long-term policy analysis might be primarily social science. That is, we've been able to get to the moon since 1969, and the technologists had moon bases by the 1980s, but society intervened. So society plays a large role in any long-term policies. There's Daniel Bell. Deep insight and vision, we talked about canon and containment a little bit. There's George Marshall and the Marshall Plan. Expert opinions have been very popular. They still are used for most long-range thinking. Get some experts together. The Delphi technique, another, another technique developed at RAND was a one method for putting together expert opinions. There are others now. There's Ted Gordon, Olaf Helmer, he and Norm Dahlke, the three of them developed the Delphi technique, which is still around for taking in expert opinions. So that's, there are others. I could mention gaming is one that people usually complain is not on the list. But there are a variety of techniques for helping us think about longer range consequences. And the question is, how good are they in terms of being able to go from there to a policy? But let me talk a little bit about what we know in terms of valuing long-term projections, if we do get them. Those values vary in time and space. Here are three values that, at least in the United States, have changed over the last 30 to 50 years. And as you get longer in term, the more likely the issues are to become more global and common values clearly differ across the globe. So this is an area where we haven't made a whole lot of progress. This really needs some more thinking about how do you think about valuing consequences of long-term policy options. And we're kind of nowhere on that one. Other than to 
presume that the values in 35 or 50 years are going to be the same as today, which is probably wrong. How do you get important stakeholders' attention? Well, you can probably think of as many of these as I can. Dystopias clearly sell better than utopias do. Write a book. There's Rachel Carson. And then use what we think of as the uh, more nitty-gritty techniques for getting a minority opinion put up before a majority. So these, we haven't done anything systematic with these, but it's clear there are techniques for getting people's attention, and the questions then become what are the best techniques for a given policy issue. Okay, there's a, one other thing I want to talk about in terms on, of what to do and when to do it depends. And this is kind of a notional three-dimensional box. Some people have had trouble visualizing it. Um, complexity, low to high, uncertainty, well characterized to deep, and policy options, few or many. Few would be on the order of build it or don't build it. Many would be kind of a wide open problem. And in this area over here where the problem tends to be reasonably well characterized, then you've got a lot of techniques for optimal decisions no matter how many policy options there are or what the complexity is. So as long as the situation is reasonably well characterized, you're in good shape with a lot of the short-term policy analysis techniques. If it, the situation is not too complex, then you can go well out in uncertainty and policy options and use techniques like scenario planning to help you think about the few sorts of plausible futures that you want to worry about. And this whole area up in here, you're looking more at robust decision making or adaptive planning or something like that. So that's, in trying to think of what to use when, this is about all we have going so far. So that's it. I'm going to stop there. Um, the long term, the this long-term policy analysis method for doing robust decision-making, as I say, you can now read in the April Scientific American. And it's something, it's another tool that we're trying to bring to the table to help with long-term policy analysis. So I will stop there. Thanks, Tim. Uh, now we'll hear from uh, Naja for her response. I told her to go there and speak. Oh, if you don't mind. You, uh, can you uh, rest the podium away from uh, <laughs> <laughs> Could be hard. He looks much better there than I do. So. Well, he's a splendid figure, it's true. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. You could assume one of the seats here okay. at the table. Okay. Thanks, Jim. needs a laser pointer. That's going to be my one contribution. <laughs> <laughs> Quite fun to play with, but uh, thank thank you very much. It, it's it's always a pleasure to be back and to be back among so many uh, so so many friends. It's it's it's, it's great to be back and uh, and 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 back with Jim. Uh, th this this was a fascinating uh, fascinating uh, uh, presentation, partly because I think anything said on this issue has to be fascinating, uh, largely because we know fairly little about it, and even more because it is in fact so important. Uh, in, in, in so many things we do. Uh, I'll, I'll restrict my comments to, to three things uh, related to what, uh, what Jim did. I was frantically taking notes. And, 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 and focus on what I learned from the talk in, in three dimensions. Uh, <laughs> one is, what is long-term policy analysis? What did I learn from him right now? Uh, second, what do we know about it? And, and finally, how to do it? Uh, whenever I hear long-term, my first reaction is to think of Keynes and, and his wonderful line, in the long term, we are all dead. Uh, though, given our current actions in the long term, more people might be dead than might otherwise have been. Uh, <laughs> but but, uh, but a couple of things that I did learn which I thought were important and, and, and which I think people talking about it should highlight like he did always is about what long term is. It relates to what long term planning, uh, policy planning is not. Uh, that it should not be confused with long term future projection. 
which is a part of long-term uh, policy analysis. Uh, it is not entirely necessary to get your projection r entirely right to do good policy analysis. And that distinction e and that relationship ought to be made clear, because if not made clear, uh, there's a whole set of people who are going to be turned off uh, as, as sort of this exercise in, in looking into the glass bowl for the future. Uh, the second thing I learned is that long-term policy planning is not just about the long term. It is about policy planning. Uh, and I found it interesting, I was going to say this later, but when you put up your three dimensions, I was thinking maybe there's a fourth dimension called time, whether it is long term, long, long term, or really long term. And then I thought, well, maybe there's not, because you have complexity and, um, and uncertainty. And between them, they will capture uh, the issue of time. I, I, I don't know. But again, sort of differentiating between uh, the long termness uh, and the policy analysis, things in uh, the, what uncertainty uh, highlighted for me is that there can be something which is far longer away in the future that we can actually prepare for much better than something that is relatively nearer in the future because we don't know the dynamics of the thing that is nearer as much as we do uh, the later. Uh, I, I work a lot in, in the environmental arena, and, and as, as Paul and others in the room know, there's this sort of constant uh, discussion there of what, what, how long is long term. Uh, if you're a politician, uh, in most places it's four years. In Pakistan, it's three weeks. Um, <laughs> that's how long it takes <laughs> for, for someone with the gun to remove you. But um, uh, if, you are a, if, if you're a policy planner, uh, in most places, people, that's why we have five and 10 year plans. That's kind of what long term means. You can hold the politician's attention, and yet you can say something reasonable. Uh, for The Economist, I think uh, Keynes was right. In the long term, you are dead. Uh, and, and our tools of discounting and others uh, start becoming, uh, for environmentalists and geologists, the long term becomes a far more, uh, far, far more uh, long exercise. And therefore, uh, f not getting fixated on just how long it has to be to be really long term, uh, I thought was good. Uh, what do we know about, about long term policy analysis? Um, in hearing what you said, I thought, what I heard was, we know that short term decisions can and do have long term policy implications sometimes intended, very often unintended, unanticipated. Uh, we do know that uh, people have tried to historically and continue to try to influence long-term decisions with their short-term policy. We do know that these efforts have generally not been as successful as those people might have, might, 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 might have. Uh, I remember uh, I was teaching a course on global governance here at BU when the millennium changed. And everyone and their dog had to have some view on the new millennium. Uh, so, so I looked for mine by sending out a graduate student to find me articles published in the Atlantic Monthly and Harper and other uh, journals in 1900. I thought, you know, people have done this before. I'm not the first one. And one of the articles I found was this really fascinating one, uh, which predicted the coming crisis of leisure. And the, the, this was amazing because the guy got just about everything right. He got the facts right. He got air travel right. He got the cell phones right. We couldn't call them those things. But the technologies he was describing were right. But the conclusion was that because of all of this, the US will be faced with the problem of the four-day weekend. And we obviously don't have enough recreational areas to deal with that. And on behalf of all of us who live the four-day weekend, I want to go and meet that guy again. <laughs> so, 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 so we haven't been as good at it. But the, the point, point I think you were making, which also needs to be highlighted in anyone talking about it, we haven't been entirely bad about it either. And those changes, while the consequences might be unintended and unanticipated, uh, you can sh put, put, th put policy on trajectories where the range of what happens are anticipated, right? uh, the, the type of future world that, that, that Paul talks about. Uh, that, that you, can, you may not be able to define the ex in exactitude what the future world is, but, but you can think and, and should maybe think uh, about putting it on that. And lastly, and I, I apologize for taking long, I'll end here. How do we do it? Uh, here I did have a question, really. Uh, you had two ways um, 
that, that you highlighted, which I thought were good. One was, if I got it right, because uh, the slide changed quickly, was long-term implications of short-term actions. So we are taking certain actions. What will be the long-term implication of that? And let's think about that in policy ways. Uh, in, in the climate world, for example, the stress report, the special report on emission scenarios, does things like that. The second you put up was short-term uh, actions needed to reach long-term goal. Here is my vision of where I want to be. What are the type of actions I think I should take now so that I get there? The GTI work that, that Paul and others have been doing. Both of these, I'm, I'm thinking in climate terms, are, are what climate people call mitigation. Uh, how, how can I do something that changes the future? It may be, I may be wrong because this was quick, it may be that there's a third category, which is putting in place long-term changes to respond to what I think the future might look like. Uh, this is very fashionable in, in just about any developing country. You, you go to any, any, any ministry in India or, or in Pakistan. Japan did this wonderful report, Japan 2100, 20, uh, which, which is not, about, not just about what do I do now to create the 2100 I want, but what do I see 2100 being? And how do I prepare myself to just get ready for things that are going to happen independent of my actions? Uh, and, 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 and it seems to me that there's a lot of uh, long-term policy analysis that also happens there. But, but again, thank you again for a, for a wonderful, wonderful uh, talk and I look forward to the discussion. Um, I'm wondering if it might make sense to turn on the house lights with the discussion. Is that, is that possible? Do you know how we do that? Is that one of these? All three. Okay. If I turn them this way. Okay. That's counterintuitive. But <laughs> I, can, I can swing with that. Um, so uh, so uh, I'll lead off with a question. It's kind of a historical question about, about uh, future studies. Um, has the, um, the length of time that uh, societies Oh, sorry, right. I'm supposed to talk into one of these uh, so we can record this for posterity um, <coughs> appropriately. Uh, <coughs> has the length of time that societies kind of incorporate within their vision changed over time? In other words, if you, you know, Otto went back to 1900 and looked at some projections in the future, are their projections any further off in the future than what we found a few years ago at the turning of the 21st uh, millennium? Are these on? You know, I think they're mostly for recording purposes. I don't think the, they amplify. Those, those are not on. Oh, those are no. not. So they're these just they're on. just props. No, no, is that no, it? It's no. supposed to look as though you're <laughs> But those but is the on. idea that a person should be holding that mic and not speaking into this? Uh, why don't you ask them? Let's have yeah. All the mics are on for recording only. Yeah, right. Okay. That's what I understand. So it's functional. It's functional. But it will not amplify your voice. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, there was a there was a serious break in a historical break at one point where we actually probably around the time of the enlightenment where we went from not thinking about the future at all mm -hmm. to beginning to think that mankind could have some effect on the future so i mean that was the biggest break was going from it's all in god's hands or something to by gosh something we could do would actually affect the future and then from then on, at least in the last century or so, you kind of see these waves of it was in the mid-60s that thinking about the longer range was popular. And every time 100 years comes up, people tend to think 100 years out. And you know, every time, literally back in the year 1000, people were thinking towards the year 2000. Not many and not well, but, but there. So it's more, I, I would say it's, kind of more random rather than a long term, finally being able to see farther and farther into the future. Okay. Interesting. David? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> George Kennan, uh, when he outlined his containment strategy, uh, suggested that the Soviet Union would internally collapse, but in 10 to 15 years. Now, in fact, it turned out to be 45 years. So my, my twofold question to you is, how, how important is the distinction then between long-term and short-term analysis? And 
with respect to Kennan, since he was wrong on the timing, would you say he was wrong or would you say he was right? Uh, but it's fair. Clearly, the, a lot of the techniques that you use for short-term planning are useful for long-term planning. And uh, in terms of trying to guess when things are going to happen, then, then all bets are off. Um, I would say Kennan got it right not because he was thinking in a temporal frame, but he got it right in the sense that he got what the Soviet Union's fragilities were. So he saw through the, that kind of deep uncertainty. So in that sense, I'd say he saw the he saw with certainty where we didn't, where others didn't. Would would you would you say would you say that even even if you were to accept the criticism of Kennan, I'm not sure that we should, but that. He said that the Soviet Union was going to collapse because of a succession crisis, and that isn't why it happened. Um, actually, and Raymond Aron, in, 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 in a speech in uh, the late 1970s, got it more right by, by suggesting it would, that it would be a failure of belief on the part of the rulers, mm -hmm. and, so, and that's, that's what happened. So if, if, if you fault Kennan, if <laughs> you fault him twice, do we still think he would? <laughs> and what what would you? And and aren't well, there many situations in which the the real thing you want predicted is not so much what's going to happen as the time frame? Uh, fair enough. Uh, it, one of the interesting things about Herman Kahn's book, The Year 2000, is he he has a list of a hundred things that are sure to happen by the year 2000. And since this is 2005, you can go look at that list and. Depending on how hard you grade, you grade him at somewhere between 20 percent and 80 percent right. And a lot of it has to do with the way that he phrased what might happen. You know, we will have some weather control. Well, what's some weather control? You know, so granted, Kennan didn't get it exactly right, but he got it right in the sense that it did affect the way policy was prescribed and Perhaps we give him too much credit for getting it right, but it did, it did send us off on a trajectory that we would not otherwise have gone on. We'd probably have gone on the Napoleon and Hitler trajectory, which was marching to Moscow. I think there's a question out here. Yeah, Jerry. Um, Jim, um, around uh, 1917, um, there was a major report on the um, health education system in the United States called the Flexner Report, um, which changed the way we teach medicine in this country, and it's become a model for, for other countries around the world. And at the time of the report, it was estimated that the chances of a patient benefiting from an encounter with a physician was about 50-50. Um, it may not be any better now, as a matter of fact. Um, however, it sounds like it's kind of a random crapshoot if you're trying to make these long-term projections, 20 percent to 80 percent right, sometimes right, sometimes wrong. But um, policy um, should not be the, the role of the dice. There should be some thought behind it. So the, so the question really is, if you're making a longer range projection of something that's going to happen, you're going to develop a policy on it, um, how long do you keep going in that way before you course correct on the basis of new evidence coming in. I mean, that's what we do in all other spheres. So why should this be any different, or maybe it isn't any different? Uh, it's a good question. Um, one of the things that I would have said had I talked about the long-term policy analysis technique that, that we've been playing with out at RAND is that we think of making the right decision more in terms of preserving flexibility in the future and not cutting off options rather than getting the right step on the first try. And all planning is eventually adaptive unless it happens to be right the first time. But the adaptive planning is very definitely, I mean, to, A, you ought to make sure that you make steps that preserve flexibility in the face of uncertainty in the future and B, to the extent that you can define adaptive steps ahead of time, that'll help you make the next step before 
you would have until you waited to see how wrong the first step went. So absolutely, I, we do adaptive planning. We don't, we don't plan to do adaptive planning. We plan typically to do what the decision is, and then we only change it when somebody else comes along and says, boy, you know, that decision that those guys made four years ago is getting us into real trouble. So that's the value of having multiple scenarios yes. at the outset. Right. You pick what looks like the best, and then you continue to add data as it, as it comes well, along. What we're trying to do is come up with robust decisions that are reasonably good across a whole variety of scenarios. In other words, they do maintain some kind of flexibility no matter what gets thrown at you. Rather than picking one that's really good only if the world goes this way and crashes if you'd happen to go that way. Can, can I make two quick points? I, I think you're exactly right. And, and that's one of the things that's not done. Because we look at the long term as sort of this projection exercise, telling where the future is going, rather than as a policy or right. planning exercise, we don't do enough course correction. Uh, or when it happens, it happens inadvertently. I, I'm guessing in the Soviet Union case, there was a lot of course correction. I mean, Kennan says something, but then history happens. And as history happens, lots of other people. Uh, but the importance is that these decisions can sometimes put you on certain trajectories, which would be very different from other trajectories. And, and that's why course correction is important. The other sort of slightly naughty point I do want to make is uh, let us also not sort of beat it too much. We are not much better at other types of policy analysis either. So we aren't very good at short-term policy analysis and getting that right. You know, I mean, look at the newspaper. Uh, <laughs> So, so, so we get that wrong too, uh, and, and I'm, I'm not sure that long term is any, uh, particularly more <laughs> susceptible to getting things wrong than short term is. Yeah, <laughs> so the, uh, the decision rule here is: if you happen to be holding a mic when one of the speaker finishes speaking, then you become the next speaker. <laughs> and I believe that's Paul Raskin. Who wants the next? <laughs> Hi, Jim. A couple of questions. Uh, one on the relationship between complexity and scenario techniques, and the other I'll call re reflexivity and try to explain it. Um, <clears throat> it went by pretty fast, but I thought you were saying that if it weren't too complex, the scenario planning approach is, is appropriate in, in, your, in your box gra graph there. And I have the opposite experience, uh, and distinguishing now very uh, clearly between uh, complication and complexity. When the system is very complex, the idea of scenarios, which of course consists of three parts, one understanding where we've been and where we're going, the trajectories of change, but most importantly, images of the future. It's in those images of the future, and I hate, I hate to wake Murray up, but we're, the idea of the claw, <laughs> uh, the, cru the, the, uh, the crude look at the hole, at the hole that, that uh, Murray Gilman talks about uh, is a way actually of penetrating through the complication to try to understand some of the complexity in a holistic image of alternative futures. And insofar as that is the core of what you do when you do scenarios, uh, it's, it's in those kind of complex situations where I find it actually uh, most useful. Now on that point, uh, another aspect of doing those, those images of the future are normative scenarios or backcasts from, you know, it doesn't have to be my, my values, it could be yours, <laughs> uh, but a whole spectrum of them that tries to take a plausible, you know, uh, array uh, of futures, uh, plausible in the sense that they're not only compatible with what we know, but with what we don't know. And, and the uncertainties, you now beyond parametric and structural uncertainties, inherent uncertainty. And then there's the un uncertainty of human choice, which is yet a fourth dimension of uncertainty. All of these concatenate to lead to a whole you know, wide spectrum of, of possibilities, which connects to my point about reflexivity. When doing scenarios or doing any thinking about the future, there are people. And one of the crucial variables are the images of the future that people have. So you do scenarios that involve what will people do, but those people are carrying images of the future that can be influenced by the very act of doing future analysis. So that's what I'm trying to say about, uh, about reflexivity so that the visions of the future be can become a material condition, a, a variable that's endogenized within the system that, that you're analyzing. Uh, 
which raises a final point when we're talking about policy analysis. Uh, which policy community are we talking about? I mean, if one is talking about making a presentation next week in Washington, it's one thing. If one is talking about influencing the policy makers 10 years from now, then who one is addressing may not be the direct official established policy community, but the citizens who may condition through their voting mechanisms or whatever the, the, the biases or the choices of, of, of policy makers in the future, in which case policy assessment turns its attention you know, to a different audience. Okay. Uh sounded like there were about three things in there. One, I, what, one of the things I should have said on that three-dimensional diagram is when you get up into the too hard box, that it's not that scenarios aren't useful up there. It's that if the situation is not too complex, then you have some feel that a, a small number of scenarios will cover the situation. And when you get up into the too hard box, then, then scenarios are definitely useful up there, and in fact, using a multitude of methods up in that box is probably the best way to go. Try to get not only scenarios, but, but expert opinion, any trend extrapolations that might help, so on and so forth. So a, a much more robust approach, including scenario planning, would be good up in that, in that too hard box. Um, in terms of the reflexivity, I agree. There are, you know, Clearly, any time you start to think about the future, you affect the way other people think about the future. And particularly in terms of policymakers, which is the third, the group that you're, you know, we're pretty agnostic in terms of trying to set up the framework for long-term policy analysis about who you're trying to address. But for any particular situation, you have to be very sure about who you're trying to address. You know, Rachel Carson was trying to address the public. You know, Richard Neustadt is trying to address policymakers in Washington. So it, particularly in the way you get someone's attention, you have to pay very close attention to who you're trying to talk to and where's the best approach to try to get something changed about the longer-term future. Rachel Carson decided it's probably best to go through popular outrage. So I agree completely in terms of paying attention to your audience. Sakita? Yeah. I, um, I think it, my co comment or question relates maybe to this issue of reflexivity. But um, you know, I know very little about all of this. But um, um, there is one way in which there's one aspect of um, um, f reflecting on the future. and. Um, in which it is a device for people to actually come together to forge a common future. And so that, you know, you're talking about methods, but actually, and of analysis, but there is another aspect of this, which is the participatory process of planning and decision making, where this kind of exercise is very important. So actually, there is an exercise going on in Africa called long-term futures, called national long-term perspective studies or something, where it is the, the issue is not some bright person with a beautiful model who comes in and does a beautiful analysis with a wonderful new methodology. But the issue is actually mobilizing the key stakeholders of a country to think about the long-term future so as to come to grips with what their problems are and to uh, agree <laughs> on where some of the, the key decisions are. So, I mean, I, I think that's another sort of handle, there's another dimension to this sort of exercise. And, and I don't know to what extent you, whether you can really think about <clears throat> um, these methods without thinking about the process and who is doing it. Is it just the sort of the technocrat, you know, in an ivory tower, or is it a, a participatory process in which the decision makers are actually part of the, ref the, the process of thinking, and the decision makers not just being some, the president of the republic, but all actors of society? This gives me a chance to, to make another point about this robust decision-making that I didn't talk about. One of the, 
it was motivated by the fact that people do have different models in their heads. And it's informed by a process that tries to get at those models. And the machinery that's used to, to run various runs of different models is set up to take in different people's models. And the notion behind it is that not only, particularly in the case of structural uncertainty, you now got different people's mental models of how the world works. And if you have a mechanism that will take those different models in, you can now show people outcomes where they can situate themselves. They say, yes, this is my viewpoint over here, or yes, that's my model over there. So that kind of robust decision making where you can take different people's models of how the world works, or different people's models of how the climate works, or different people models of, of how the social security system works, and put them all in there and run policies against all of those models, now you can start looking at robustness across people's varying opinions of how the world works. And uh, it's clearly not the, not the unclouded crystal ball, but the, the reason we set the machinery up to be so flexible was so that we could take not just a model and do kind of the classical computational sensitivity analysis, but easily take a variety of models and now start to get the discussion on a common plane where everybody can see that their opinions and their ideas about how the system works are being accounted for. So that's one way of trying to get at that, that Tower of Babel. I think we have I um, appreciated, you know, sort of the, the notions of how difficult um, long-term policy uh, decision-making can be. And as you were going through your presentation, I was trying to think about structural conditions uh, in a state or in a government that makes it easier, facilitates, or obstructs uh, those processes. And so, you know, from one, one point, sort of counterpoint to what Sakiko was just saying, authoritarianism in some ways seems to be helpful, right, in the sense that China, Right? I mean, long-term planning, they make lots of mistakes, but there's no question in many ways it's easy to do long-term planning for whether it's large projects or whether it's, um, you know, geopolitical condition and relations, whether it's building the military and transformation internally, whether it's uh, um, energy uh, uh, policy, than the United States. Uh, and so democratic countries could seem to be in that regard hamstrung to some degree. Um, second point would be uh, integration of uh, decision-making structures. So you think about the stovepiping that happened in the intelligence community before 9-11, obviously to the extent that you have larger numbers of people that are sort of engaged in a process and involved in decision making, that can help because longer range decision, make, decision making planning involve, can necessarily involves lots of different discrete types of people and parts of information. I mean, those are two, uh, those are the only two I thought of. I, I'm wondering if uh, you've done a lot more thinking, what, what other conditions, structural conditions of states are sort of most important in your mind to either facilitate, obstruct, um, the, the, the long-range process? Not much. I mean, that's, you bring up good points. We've basically done it from a, from the theoretical standpoint of optimum long-range planning. Um, clearly, in an authoritarian regime, you can say, this is our long-term plan, and um, that's the way it's going to work. And, and to some extent, you can invent the future, which is what people who don't like planning like to do, is inventing the future. No, we haven't thought a lot about that. It's definitely worth thinking about. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. And this gentleman's been waiting over here. Uh, if you just grab a mic so we can. Uh, Jim, this is just to supplement what you said. You spoke about the Ford India report. And the first India report uh, totally missed the growth in 30 years of a second Indian economy, the Indian diaspora, outside. And that economy today is as large as the Indian economy at home. 25 million people of Indian origin alone outside produce as much wealth as 1.2 billion, 1.1 billion Indians at home. It's totally missed. So there was a second Indian population which they got right, but a second Indian economy which they didn't even think of. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, like um, I'm sorry. Uh, did, unless nope. you want to have it. 
brief response. Sorry to have to bring this to a close because I have a feeling that we're on the verge of, uh, of, of some other interesting conversations. However, there's a full day ahead of us, and I'm sure we'll have a chance to come back to some of these points. I want to thank our panelists for uh, a really stimulating uh, presentation. And uh, I'll pass it back to you, David. Um, Five-minute break. Five break. OK, let's give, it, give a hand to the uh, Thanks a lot.